Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today is someone that I met back in San Antonio in, gosh, it was 2018. And uh, his name is Matthew Pollard. And he's the author of the Introvert's Edge series. He was recently named Global Guru's number three top sales professional. And the first book in the series, The Introvert's Edge, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell Anyone, has sold 55,000 copies. It's in 15 languages. And the second book in the series uh, just recently uh, this last week was the number 10 best selling book on Audible. And thank heavens I met him back in 2018, right as the first book was launching, because I don't know how I could have gotten him on this podcast if I didn't, you know, already have his number. So, uh, Matthew, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to talk with you uh, and welcome. Mate, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me on and the great introduction. Ah, thank you. Well, you know, like you said, uh, as we were talking before we we lit up the recording, this is pretty good for an introvert. Like you're doing really well for an introvert here. You know, you're number three on Global Guru's top sales professional behind two like almost over overweening extroverts, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, and look, I think it's interesting. Like we we're like introverts are just supposed to hide under a bridge, right? And never talk to anyone. So, you know, I, I, I think that that is the way most people perceive introverts. So, you know, one of the mm. things, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of lists, but I think it's important to be on it because it highlights that introverts really can succeed. They don't have to see themselves as second class citizens. Right. Well, you know, Matthew, one of the reasons I'm so particularly excited to talk to you here on speak like a leader dot show is because I think I have a lot of introverts that are listening and I, you know, I do a lot of training for organizations, do a lot of one-on-one -on -one executive coaching. A lot of that stuff will often begin around giving a TED-like talk. And one of the things that I tell the people that I work with who are oftentimes very introverted because I work a lot with scientists. I work a lot with, with people who are very logical and being introverted comes along with that territory sometimes. I think it's really generous for someone who is not naturally extroverted to be willing to do the things that you talk about in your book and go out there anyway and look at what you've accomplished, right? As somebody who's self-described an introvert, but because you had the, I think it's real generosity. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I think that what's really interesting is a lot of people will hear me speak and hopefully everyone hears this as you know, me speaking in an articulate way and getting to the point. And they say, they'll naturally hear that and they'll say, well, it's easy for him. He must be an extrovert now. Like that's even possible. Like, you know, it, it, it's not something you can change or switch off about yourself. You know, I obviously speaking from stage takes a lot less energy from me than it used to, because when you get better at something, it doesn't stress you out as much. So naturally right. you don't feel as, as tired afterwards. Now I will say if I speak at a back to back, you know, two keynote presentations or a keynote in a workshop, like a kid at Disneyland, at the end of the day, I'm tired. I want to go straight to bed. But, you know, it doesn't mean I can't network. It doesn't mean I can't right. sell you right. It, it definitely takes energy. This this podcast, you know, it's backed up right with my lunch break because I know that after this, I'm going to have to crash for 20 minutes and just watch Netflix and talk to no one because I have to recharge my batteries for the next phone call that I have to have. But yeah. you, you're 100% right. I mean, when introverts make the decision to speak from stage, when they make the decision to network or sell or, you know, go do anything really that's a so-called extroverted arena, they may be making the decision for the, to, to get business. They may be making the, 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 the decision because they know they need to get their staff's productivity up. And so maybe that's why they're speaking. But in truth, I think most introverts are really, really good at saying, well, it's not about me. And the truth is, if it's about them, they feel inauthentic. They feel incongruent. So the ones that are trying to be more extroverted and make it about them, they're going to fail. That's why our path to success is just different. We have to make it about the people we mean to serve. And if we do that, then yes, it is still them going out, an introvert going out of their way to help. However, it actually feels a lot more comfortable for us when we do it that way. And therefore, yeah. it doesn't feel like it takes so much from us. You know, Matthew, one of the greatest pieces of advice that I ever, ever got 
and I think it's, you know, it was around uh, like public speaking and being in front of people, but I think it's also the best advice for leadership. I think it's the best advice maybe just for life in general that I ever got is just what you said, but it came from a guy named Snoop Doggy Dog. I don't know if you know <laughs> Snoop Dogg, but back in the day when he was the D-O-double-G dog, he said, don't be nervous, be at their service. And it's one of the things that I notice about you and in your writing and in your approach is that you are very, very good at making it about being of service. Which is, I think, you know, if we just want to cut right to the chase about your message, you know, I think that's the key that unlocks the secret door that extroverts don't have the same kind of access to because so often being extroverted can kind of make it seem like it's about me as opposed to about them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the the things that I tell people all the time is it's not about you. And as soon as it's not about you, funnily enough, we can do much, much more. I think introverts need to know what they're passionate about and have a mission that they're on. And that works when you're working in a career. It's what's the change you want to see happen in your organization? What's the change you want to see in your department? What are the new products and services you want to see out there? What's the mm. TED talk about, right? What, what, what is the mission yeah. that we're trying to transform? You know, from a small business approach, I mean, in truth, even extroverts struggle with this. When they have to promote themselves for the first time, all of a sudden they start behaving a lot more like introverts because it's like, well, how can I not take that rejection personally? And yeah. you know, I, don't, I don't want to seem like we're extroverted bashing here a little bit because, I mean, extroverts have their own burdens to bear. I mean, a lot of people will say they're not, they're, they're not the best listeners. They're not the most empathetic. I think the real difference is that introverts see it as a barrier that they cannot cross, this gaff, mm. gift of gab wall that we cannot make it through, where extroverts will just say, well, I'm, I'm not that great a listener. I'll go and do an active listening class. Or somebody from yeah. HR will notice that that senior leader isn't the most empathetic and that's required. So they might, you know, get Daniel Goleman's, you know, emotional intelligence book in front of them and say, maybe you need to go to this seminar, read the book and see what you think. But when yeah. they see an introvert, they're like, oh, poor Johnny or poor Sarah, we've just got to keep them away from customers or we can't put them in, <laughs> we can't get them to manage a team because they're kind of abrupt. Well, the truth is that's a skill set too. And I think that we, we need to stop. And I, you know, I've seen people do like, Myers Bridge test, and like, oh, the introverts, let's put them over there in the quiet jobs. Like, that's what they want. Now, some of them do, and that's great, but there are others that want to sell, they want to lead, they want to speak and lead, be the visionary. They just don't know that they can. And as yeah. senior leaders, it's our job to get those people inspired and help them realize not that they have to, but if they choose to, they really can not just survive in this extroverted world, but I actually think dominate because I don't see it as an extroverted world. I see it as introverts have just been sold a lie that they have to have this, this gift of gab. And you know, every time I find an introvert confront that stigma head on and say, I'm going to learn a system for selling, a system for networking, a system for leadership, all of a sudden they tend to be some of the best leaders, the best salespeople, the best networkers in the world. Well, I mean, I got to imagine that your system could apply for extroverts as well. Yeah, I mean, the truth is, and you know, this isn't new stuff. I mean, Brian Tracy talks about the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. Now, <laughs> in the top 10%, though, there's extroverts like Jeffrey Gittimore who says, I couldn't teach anybody. You know, I was on his show and he's like, I could not teach anyone until I realized that I had to explain it as a system. And the truth is that there are, I mean, people like Zig Ziglar. I mean, you'd think yeah. he was the most extroverted person on the planet, but he's an introvert. You know, I interviewed his uh, his son, Tom Ziglar, on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge. And, you know, he talked about his dad and how introverted his dad was. But so people think that they need to be that gift of gab to be in the top 10%. No, it's planning and preparation. The truth is the top of the bottom 80% say whatever comes out of their mouth. And those people tend to be the extroverts. They're also the ones that tend to brag about it more, right? <laughs> so because of that, we hear about it all the time. Now, of course, yeah. an introvert without a system, well, we're terrible at sales. So we need to have a system. The problem is that if you don't think you're able to run it, you're not going to be able to finish the marathon. Why start? So most people just avoid it. They, If they run their own business, they do what I call busy procrastination. They focus on the other elements. If they're inside an organization, they tend to avoid those jobs or accept subpar performance. But if we were to go across the gambit, right, most people will say, well, hang on a second, but introverts can't network though. Well, hang on a second. Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group in the world, personal friend of mine, happens to be an introvert. 
Oh, well, they can't speak from stage. Well, Zig Ziglar was a pretty good speaker. Ryan Dice runs the Traffic and Conversion Summit. He's the person that said, he, I mean, he won't even go on stage unless there's a back entrance. But he said, as soon as I realized it wasn't about me and I could make it about the audience, I'm fine on stage. I just am scared about being trampled when I come off the stage. So I want the back entrance. But you look at leaders. I mean, think about the thing that we all know introverts can't do, small talk. Well, hang on a second. Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres, both introverts. So yeah. how is this really true? It's just this belief system that we have, even though all the evidence highlights that it's not accurate. Yeah. You know, Matthew, it's, it's, I, I, I'd love your feedback on this. I'd love your, your take on this because that is one of the small talk is the thing that you said that I'm queuing on. And that is, in my opinion, and through my research and my work, I've come to believe that that is, so it's just one of the most crucial things ever. And I think it's been misnamed. I think we call it small talk because we misunderstand it. Now, just a real quick background of what I say. I say that when we go out to do sales or to convince people to do things or to influence or whatever, very often we get yes, 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 no. And we're like, what? Why did I just get yes, 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 no? Like what, what, why yeses and then a no? Are they lying? What's going on? Well, here's what happens. In, in retrospect, it's very obvious. Yes, yes, yes is usually for the logic of the, of the proposal or whatever, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. But then no is do we sign the check or not, right? So yes, the logic, yes, the logic, yes, the logic, no, the emotional connection. We didn't make the emotional connection. And so small talk is an incredibly powerful way to set oneself up for yes, 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 as opposed to yes, 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 no. The reason we misunderstand and call it small talk is because on some level, it seems like it doesn't matter what we talk about. And on some level, it doesn't matter what we talk about, but what does matter is that we talk about something that connects us, something where we can find that emotional connection. We can both be in the same tribe. It could be the weather. It could be our kids that are school age. It could be where we grew up, you know, whatever. But if it's, if if people start to focus in on making small talk connection time, it goes from being small talk and unimportant to being big talk and very important. And when I see people, the lights go on for people around small talk like that, I find it makes it much easier for anybody, particularly introverts, to start to want to engage in small talk because they see the larger purpose. Is that in, in sync with what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so firstly, I mean, what we're really talking about is not small talk. We're talking about rapport generation. Uh, There you go. Very well said. Exactly. So when you think about rapport generation, it's do I see this person as like me? Do I see that I I, that I like them? So, yes, the logical version makes 100 percent sense. But hey, mate, I just I don't feel like I've got a connection with you. So if I've got to work with you over the next five years or 12 months or three (laughs) months to do this integration, can't I speak to one of your buddies that I might? have a better relationship with or in truth in this commoditized world we now live in there's someone over there that offers a similar product maybe not be as good but gosh you know i can i can i can have a chat with that person yeah so yes i mean absolutely developing rapport is is very very important but what i find and i'm going to answer this question in two parts actually mm. is yep. that there is a way to generate rapport without focusing on small talk that i find works phenomenally well. And, you know, I talk about story being the heart of a sale, being harder than networking. In truth, it's the harder speaking from stage as well. And yeah. the the thing that you'll find, and, you know, I, I, I talk about story from stage all the time. And funnily enough, when I wrote The Introvert's Edge, I mean, my passion is helping introverted service providers realize that there is a way to rapid growth, right? Yeah. And that's always been my focus. But funnily enough, you know, I, I, I often get called to speak at big corporations and it's often, you know, big tech um, big tech um, finance, you know, anything that's a really highly complex sale or really highly complex period uh, ideologies, right? You know, it, 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 it's really interesting that when I get up and I talk about storytelling, a lot of people, I help them realize that for me, the reason why when I get up on stage and I start with a story 
is because I'm really uncomfortable. As an introvert, I find getting on stage really uncomfortable. And I'm not the person that can say a joke and just instantly win people over. It just feels uncomfortable. That's the extroverted way, but it's definitely not mine. So the first thing I'll do is I'll start with the story. And there's some real keys for why this works. But the first one and the most important for the introverts listening, by the way, this can be done when you just as a manager get up and need to speak to an entire team and need to get them on board. Or you get a new job and you've got to explain why you're excited about working with people. Or you've got a new objective that you need to win a senior set of leaders behind, you know, get them behind it and get the stakeholder support. You know, I'll yes. get on and I'll say, you know, thanks for such a great introduction. How will I live up to, you know, such a wonderful introduction? I know. Let me tell you about Wendy and I'll get straight into a story. And what <laughs> happens is as soon as I start telling the story, the reticular activating systems of our brain, this is a study out of Princeton, actually synchronize and it actually creates artificial rapport that I can then leverage into real rapport as I win them over through the rest of the conversation. But all of a sudden when our brains synchronize, I automatically feel at ease and everybody else, it's like I see their heads kind of tilt and it's like everybody's now on my team and I get yeah. people that are really excited to see me succeed because they feel like they have a relationship. Story does that. Now, there are some yeah. other great benefits like the study out of Princeton that highlights people remember up to 22 times more information when embedded into a story. So for those yes. people that want to deliver a bunch of jargon, story will stop you from putting as much in because you have to make it relevant to the story, which is important because in truth, no one wants a fire hose of information. But then secondly, people will actually retain it and they'll remember the details in the story. But my favorite is story actually short circuits the logical mind. So if you're thinking about the logical mind, this is the part of the brain that instead of saying yes, 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 no, is the part that could be saying, I'm not sure if that applies to me. My situation's different. I don't have time for this. Hang up. Or sorry, the Zoom meeting's over, which we're all confronted with these days. And the, the truth is that when you tell a story, it literally short circuits the logical mind. It literally, the, the emotional brain short circuits, it, short, short circuits it and literally goes story time and listens. And it hears yeah. all of the story and it tunes into that. So story is really, really powerful for that. However, no. yes, if you're at the beginning of a conversation, you can't go straight into a story like I do from stage. Now, you want to get to that as quickly as possible. But, you know, I do things like when I went to somebody's house, if I was doing door-to-door -door sales back years ago, I'd ask if they want me to take off my shoes because it's respectful. Funnily enough, a lot of people would say no, but people would still appreciate me offering because they're tired of those tradespeople walking in with their, their sh mud all over their shoes, fixing one thing, breaking another. If... I go in and in the afternoon and somebody would offer me a coffee. I'd say, I'd always say yes to something, but I would say, gosh, if I had one more cup of coffee, I'll be bouncing off the walls. Um, a glass of water would be great. If, if it's the morning, I'd, I'd, I'd have this whole conversation about how I found that it gave me too many upward and, and downward inflections in my mood. So I moved to Mate tea. And when, then we'd have this whole joke about how they could never give up coffee. It was all planned. And because of that, for me, it was just this, it was Groundhog Day. For them, yeah. it's seemed like an organic conversation. Now, yes. the last thing I will say on this is a lot of corporation executives really struggle with saying, well, how do I, how do, I do it when I go to a conference or when I go to a meeting? Like they can't know anything about the person before they walk in. You guys are lucky or girls are lucky. I mean, I remember I was talking, I, I spoke at Intel and I, at the end of the conversation, I had one person, sorry, at the end of the presentation, I went back to my hotel and somebody talked to me afterwards for like 30 minutes. He just ran into me in the hotel talked my ear off and he said, oh, but I'm an introvert. It's easy for me to do this because I'm, I, I can talk about the presentation and how it was relevant to me. But small talk is not something I can just do. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. You work for Intel, right? And he's like, well, yeah. And I said, well, from what I've heard about Intel, they call the newbies somebody that's been there for less than 20 years. So <laughs> did you know everybody that was coming? He's like, well, yeah, I mean, most of them have been there last year. Like they're all part of the senior leadership team. The global leadership group comes together and that's the event you spoke at. I said, so you could have looked at everyone's LinkedIn profile, seen what books they just read, who you wanted to have a conversation with, done your research, found out somebody was into Peloton or somebody just read, you know, Think and Grow Rich and had a dialogue about that. You could have come into that meeting knowing who you wanted to speak to and had a bunch of pre-planned things to say. I mean, I wanted one day in the past wanted to sell to someone at Dell. I noticed on their Instagram they were really into Peloton and I just said, it's really wet outside and I'm not able to exercise going running the way I would like. He took my ear off for 30 minutes about Peloton. At that point, I didn't need to foster any rapport. He'd done it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I tell people, 
looking at your looking at people's LinkedIn profile, that's not stalking. <laughs> you know, that's a really great opportunity for you to know your audience and to think about that. And you know, I I do love your focus on preparation and whether people are introverted or extroverted has absolutely nothing to do with how much preparation is going to make a difference. And in, you know, in the world of Ted and Ted like talks, the people that speak on the Ted stage, they've been working on their talk for a year, yeah. six months minimum. Those people have gone, you know, they can do it backwards, forwards in the middle of the night, standing with one foot, you know, on a, on their roof. And, it'll come out the same because they've been so driven and drilled to practice and someone like Steve jobs, you know, I mean, I think that before I knew all this, I think even I kind of thought he walked out on stage and winged it couldn't be anything further from the truth. And of everybody that I work with the absolute best speakers and leaders and communicators are always the ones. Maybe they do have a natural gift of being good off the cuff. Okay, great. That's a nice natural gift. None of them do that in the things that matter. They've all practiced backwards, forwards, upside down, a million ways from Sunday and know what they're going to do. And and that's what makes them so good. You know, the people who seem really good off the cuff are the ones who practice the most. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. just how it is. Now, Matt, Matthew, I wonder, because this, you know, a lot of what you're telling people is, is I, I think, is reflected in a lot of what I tell people, different angles, different directions, but similar messages. When you had those conversations with those people that you knew would evolve from, oh, I drink matcha now, uh, okay, that was like Groundhog Day for you, it, it, but, it, but it was brand new for them. What would you do so that that wouldn't seem and feel robotic? How would you deal with that? Well, so this is the same as what we were just discussing around preparation. It's making sure that it comes across as natural. I mean, when you're a comic, by the way, some of the best stand-up comedians in the world are introverted. And I will tell you, a lot of the people that speak from stage that are even extroverted will do improv classes just so they can be more dynamic, right? Because these are all skill sets. Yes, you can be naturally good at something, but somebody that isn't naturally good that learns the skill sets better than you will still be better at it than you. So because of that, of course, the people that are natural, it's like I remember like if you go to an accounting university, if you're not naturally good at numbers, the person that is diligent and has a natural ability, yes, may beat you hands down. But the truth is, they're less likely to apply themselves. So because of that, you're more likely to beat them. I mean, when you go to law school, you've got naturally intelligent people that lose to the studiers. So for yeah. me, preparation is everything. So before, yeah. I mean, I, I just talked about the fact that I, I did my first live presentation in San Diego. And yeah. last week that happened and I was you know super excited, super nervous to be back in front of a live audience though, yeah. because the dynamic's different. So I started practicing my stage presence again, because I hadn't done it in 18 months. Now, virtually, I've got the whole floor marked up and I yeah. can move from different, you know, because we do a ton. We've got multiple cameras, multiple sets, a producer, you know, the whole floor's taped up so I can move and I know when I'm on camera and when I'm not. But when you're back on a flat stage, you've got three places to look and you've it's it's different. So I planned and I prepared, right? Yeah. So the, the thing you've got to realize, though, is that when you're doing a virtual, you have to pause for a laugh. When you're in a room, though, you have to pause longer because you have to wait for people to quieten down. Now, when I say these jokes, I know that people laugh, but I actually had a coach that watched me speak to say, oh, Matt, that's funny. You need to stop there because I don't know what's funny. I'm an introvert and I just don't know. So sometimes <laughs> I'll say something and people will laugh yeah. and I'll feel uncomfortable. So the first yeah. time I deliver a presentation, I will wait. I will deliver it in front of somebody that will say, that's funny. That's funny. They'll laugh yeah. so I can get it out, you know, and, and practice it. Now, when somebody speaks from stage, you shouldn't be able to tell whether or not it's, you know, a lot of extroverts, you'll say, hey, can you just deliver that exact same presentation to this group? And the answer they'll say is, no, I can't because I don't remember what I said. I was in the moment. Now, some extroverts that are more planned and prepared, by the way, they're your better speakers because yes. they are also yes. following a plan, like the best salespeople, like the best networking, extrovert or introvert alike, 
planning and preparation and a system will always win over. Yes. If you get an, if you get an introvert and say, hey, can you do that exact same thing? The answer is, well, yes, I can either look at the lights with terror and not be able to speak because I wasn't prepared, or I can deliver the exact same professional presentation over and over again because it's regimented. But yeah. when I delivered it, the thing is I would practice saying it and I would practice the, the the tone of my voice. I would practice my eye contact. I'd practice it in the mirror because when I first walked into a room, that was my first impression. Now, here's something I can't do. I can't walk into the room, notice a picture on the wall of a, f- a sporting team and have a dialogue about that. I am going to do really bad at that. <laughs> but I could spend the next six months learning about all the sporting teams so that I could talk about it authentically. I mean, I can't even notice a photo of a child with, and, and, and fishing and bring up a quick story about, you know, fishing with my dad. Because if it's not planned, if it's not prepared, I will get stuck in my head trying to work out what to say. But if I can plan a conversation, which is true, by the way, for a whole period of time in my life, I gave up coffee because I found that I struggled to, to be creative because I have reading issues and spelling issues. So when I was trying to write, when I try to be creative, as soon as I hit a spelling issue, my, the, my fight or flight mechanism would kick into action and that's the end of the creative day. So yeah. I moved to Mate T, which leveled me out. So it was an authentic conversation. Yeah. But it was an authentic, and if I had a, thought about bringing it up on the fly, I wouldn't have been able to say it so well. But yeah. because I'd practiced it, I delivered, and this is the important thing for an introvert, I'm not being fake. I'm not. I'm being the most authentic version of myself. I just planned and rehearsed it in a way that I can do it over and over again to present the best version of myself. But planning applies to everything. I mean, think about the yeah, extra manager. I mean, think about the extroverted manager that goes out and says, hey, I'm going to run a meeting. Everyone come into the office. Let's have a quick chat. And then they look at Matthew Matthew sitting in the corner who's got who's contributed nothing, and they say, Matt's always got a great idea, but he always comes to me like the day after, and then we've already implemented things, and I get annoyed with him because his idea is better than what we came up in the room, but I've already implemented it. So I'm going to say, Matt, what are your thoughts on this? And now Matt's like, he's like, I don't know what to say, and I haven't really thought this through. But hang on a second. If you had a plan, hang on a second. What am I going to do tomorrow? Okay, I want to run a meeting on blah. Okay, who am I going to want in the meeting? Okay, I'm going to want these people. What are the questions I'm going to want to ask? Now, firstly, your meeting's going to go a lot better because people are tired mm. of meetings without agendas, especially on Zoom where people don't even feel included anymore. And that's why they switch their cameras off and they, they're off doing their dishes and you think they're still sitting in the meeting. Yeah. But the truth is that if you do that and then you say, well, actually, Matt's always got really great ideas, but he doesn't share them till the next day. So I'm going to put in brackets, Matthew, I'm really looking forward to your thoughts on this specific question. Now, yeah. He's churning about it, or she's, or Sarah, maybe is an introverted female on your team, is churning away on that idea. When you ask, you're now going to get that that question. When you ask that question, he or she is going to have a response. And when they respond, wow, their answer is going to be impactful. But then everyone else gets to build on that idea. Everybody else that hasn't prepared can now talk about that idea, and it will become even better. So if you don't plan. What is it? It was a Winston Churchill statement, a quote, I think. Those who, pl- um, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. <laughs> That's funny. That's really true. And, you know, I, 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 it's just absolutely key. Uh, you know, I, ca- I talk about the Valley of Awkwardness in honor of Chris Anderson of TED, but that's the place for me where you've practiced so much, it looks like you practiced a lot. And people get to that and they think, oh, well, I shouldn't practice because it makes me seem canned. No, you just didn't practice enough to get across that valley just takes even more practice. And then you get to the other side where you've practiced so much. It seems like you haven't practiced. And I love what you said. Then you are your most authentic, best version of yourself. And because you've practiced so much, you can now be much more present with people and you can be paying attention to a whole new level of things that were would never have made it into your attention if you hadn't practiced enough that you weren't worried about what you were going to say. You're yeah? 100% right. I mean, we can we can play with that for a second. Like everybody that's listening now, like let's let's do a quick exercise. Think back to your favorite movie. Think mm-hmm. back to the favorite character in that movie. 
Now it's either going to be a, an ex- you might be thinking of like a Tom Hanks or a Leonardo DiCaprio, both introverts, by the way. You might uh-huh. be thinking of a Meryl Streep, also introverted, by the way. You could be thinking about, you know, uh, the how authentic they were and how natural they came across. And then maybe you'll realize that they were also reading from scripts. The yes. difference is that when we think about a script, we're like, oh, no, I don't want to sound scripted. Well, they didn't. How did they manage to do it? Well, the difference is that the person that we think about when we think about scripting is like a telemarketer calling us at 8 o'clock at night. They're reading off a script and they haven't practiced. They haven't prepared. Now, when you think about this conversation to everyone else, it probably, well, I'm hoping it sounds authentic. It sounds organic. But for me, while there are parts of this conversation that I've said, I've said all of these things on other interviews i've never said them in this order and i've never yes. you know never said them also with a conversation with john so because of that like i said with the introvert that's getting called on now in a meeting john's now building on this and we're having a dialogue that's becoming its own entity its own item but a lot of the things that i'm saying at the beginning start off with pre-planned conversations now this is also my zone of genius so this is the 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 power of this when you're talking about something you're truly passionate about i mean you get somebody that you know i was i had a i've got a client that works with autistic children and you get one this autistic child that struggles to talk to anyone about anything you get him talking about the titanic oh my gosh he'll talk your ear off and he doesn't care who's watching (laughs) you get me talking about introversion and sales introversion and networking introversion in general you can't get me to stop talking because this is a topic i love it's also my zone of genius now if John brings up what's currently happening with all of the, the spacecrafts and the, the the current, you know, space race that's going on, yeah, I might have some things to add, but it's not going to be long before I have nothing interesting to say. And jo- it's going to be very clear, John knows a lot more about it than I do. But when we stick within my zone of genius and when I plan, I can plan a conversation to stay within my zone of genius. But yeah. if I don't plan, guess what? All of a sudden, I'm at a networking event and John's talking about the space race and I have nothing to add. And because of that, I'm going to feel very introverted. Mm. So, you know, Matthew, what are some of the, I don't want to have you give away all the secrets in your book because I'd I'd love to, you know, sell a few more copies and get you past 55K. But what are, what, give us, can you give us an example or two of some of the things that you, like some of the brass tacks, here's how to implement some of this that you talk about in this series. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can tell you in the like 13 minutes or so we're going to have left of this interview, if I could download all of the book, gosh, that would be yeah. impressive. So yeah, I think that there are a couple of things that we really need to, to focus on. And the first thing is, while I'd like to say, yes, I have a system for sales, I have a system for networking, the truth is it doesn't need to be my system. The fact of the matter is that the first chapters, which by the way, I always tell people, you know, my publisher hates me when I say this, you don't need to buy my books. I mean, at theintrovertsedge.com, you can download the first chapter of my sales book, theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking, you can download the first chapter of the networking book. And that literally highlights, well, firstly, it'll help you overcome your belief that you can sell and network as an introvert. And then it will literally break down, like in the sales one, for instance, it'll give you the full seven steps to a sale. And if you do nothing more than look at what you currently say and put what you uh, what you do say in under those seven steps, quickly you'll realize some things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. Then you'll realize there's some things out of order. And then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, especially for introverts. They think they tell great stories, but all they do is download data and jargon. So filling in those gaps, you will double your sales in the next 60 days, and you will be able to become an extraordinary networker just by following those steps. Now, the truth is, you do not need to follow my steps. What you need to do is A, believe you can, and B, follow somebody's process that is an A to Z kind of structure. Now, you you might pick up, like I think, you know, The Psychology of Sales written by Brian Tracy is a great book, but it doesn't give you a regimented structure. So look for, and there are plenty of them out there, books that allow you to follow regimented structures. Also, I'm not the only introverted sales coach out there. As I said to you, Zig Ziglar's got plenty of books and he happens to be an introvert. Jeb Blunt, Mark Hunter, I mean, Lee Sales, they're all introverts. So the thing that I really want people to understand is it doesn't matter if you want to succeed in sales, networking, leadership, public speaking, 
you need to follow a process if you want to succeed as an introvert. Yes, you need to plan. Yes, you need to prepare. Yes, you need to practice. And then you also, I believe, need somebody that is introverted. It doesn't necessarily mean they need to have the word introvert stamped on their book, but must be introverted because, A, you need to, be, again, you need to believe that it's possible. And a lot of extroverts will say, hey, Matt, it's easy. You just do this. Well, it isn't easy for us. You know, Brian Smith, um, who's the founder of Billion Dollar Brand Ugg Boots, is a personal friend of mine. And he had a sales coach before, uh, sorry, a speaking coach before, you know, before we met. And they said, you know, they always told me to use these little like jokes and things. It always felt uncomfortable for me. And so I shared with him my introverted process for speaking from stage and talked about, you know, storytelling. And I mean, he he killed it at the recent Inc. 500 conference. He just did amazingly well. He just is a great speaker, but following an introverted system. So if we think about what I would consider the key parts of both my sales system, my networking system, and if I was to write a book on networking or speaking from stage, the most crucial part of that would be storytelling, which we haven't covered the framing of the story, but we've covered why stories are important. Now, what I find is many people will talk about the fact that, oh, yeah, you know, I you know, I had a customer, they wanted this, so we gave it to them. That is not what I mean by storytelling. This <laughs> is why you need to be more planned, you need to be more prepared, right? I mean the story, more uh, telling stories, more like how you met your husband or wife or your, your partner, right? Stories that over time become kind of theatrical masterpieces, right? They're at the start, they might be a little yeah. bit more bulky than they should be. They Then over time, you cut things out, you embellish on certain elements, still true because we're trying to sell and be authentic, but you might really hammer home certain points. And over time, you just get really good at telling it. Now, when you do that, you don't need lots of stories. Like if you think about doing a job interview and somebody says, give me an example. I mean, we all know the question that comes up. Give me an example of a challenge that you had in a previous job and how you overcame that. Well, you can either come up with something off the top of your head. You can <laughs> give them a detailed explanation of what you could do, what you did, or you could explain this theatrical masterpiece of how you came to that problem, some of the decisions that you made, how you fostered other stakeholders to come together, how you did it as a team so it's not all about you, which introverts hate doing and person will love to hear, and how you get them, we got the result that we wanted, right? If you're trying to um, go to a, you know, have a meeting and you want to get people invested in this new KPI that just seems like a lot of work for a sales team or a lot of work for a product development company, uh, part of the team, you could say, you know, I was in the customer service center the other day. And, you know, Trevor, one of our customer service reps, was on this phone to a senior citizen, and here's the emotional issues that that were going on. And, gosh, it was just such a horrific situation. So I suggested this, and that got me thinking, why don't we do this for all of our other customers? And you can build this story around something that's more about than, hey, look, we really just want to get more senior citizens as customers because we realize that's a great money maker for us, right? right? So, which again, it's not, hey, I really want to do this so we can all go and buy new cars. It's, hey, we really want to do this because it makes a difference. So story is definitely going to be the most important. But the other things, when you think about the steps, if you go to a networking room, again, it, 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 it comes back to the same thing. It's about not making it about you. So how, what questions can you ask to be, to be interested before you can be interesting? You know, if you want to be a leader, the thing that's naturally great about introverted leaders is they want to be interested in their team. They want to know about their, their, their team members. Being more extroverted is not going to help with that because when we think we have to behave more extroverted, we think it's our job to talk and tell them what they're supposed to do. No, embrace your introversion and work out a system that's going to work for you. Now, mm. if I was to say the, the number one technique that I would really recommend that's probably going to help you if we're going to talk about sales or networking, let's talk about networking because I know a lot of your team, you know, a lot of people that are listening are leaders. Let's talk about the fact that when you go networking, the most important meetings that you're going to have, and if you're a small business owner listening to this, it's, it's going to apply to you even more so. You, the focus of your going into that networking room is not about getting your next sale. It's not about getting your next job, right? This is what I call going after prospects. Everyone thinks they're going to networking rooms because they're trying to sell or get hired for that or get that next promotion. The people that are the most important people that you're ever going to meet in a room, and this requires long-term fostering of relationships, are what I call momentum partners and champions. Now, if you go into a networking room and you're an introvert and you think it's all about getting promoted or it's all about getting that next, you know, that next, you know, gig, well, then the truth is that's going to feel really uncomfortable. But if it's about going after these two groups of people, 
it's going to be really powerful. Now, for that, you have to be a giver too. But if you go into a networking room, my belief is that the key out of the hamster wheel is looking for what I call momentum partners. So a momentum partner is somebody that believes in what you're doing. Now, you have to have something that you're doing. So it's not, oh, my day job's this because that's boring. It's, you know, you know, I'm passionate about helping introverts realize that they're not second-class citizens. Their path to success is just different to that of an extrovert. You have to have a mission. I'm on a mission to help introverted service providers specifically get out of that busy procrastination and learn the three steps that they can utilize to obtain rapid growth in their business. Now, if you have a passion and mission for something that what you do, then when you're interested to a momentum partner, then you share your passion and mission. They're going, wow, that's really inspiring. And all of a sudden, they'll start introducing you to people because they believe in what you do. Now, again, plan so you don't walk into the networking room or the event and speak to the wrong people. No, connect with them beforehand. So when you walk in, I mean, you've got a 50-50 shot, they're going to be introverted too. So when you walk into the room, if they're introverted, they're going to see you and go, finally, a face I know, and they're going to come up and talk to you. Share your passion and mission and then offer you know, introductions to them. They'll offer introductions to you and that will grow your network substantially. And then the last group is the champion group. And the champion group are the people that believe in your work and give it credibility right? If you work in an organization, having one senior leader that believes, that felt your passion and mission will open up so many doors for you. I mean, for me, I mean, we talk about Tom Ziegler, we talk about, you know, Ivan Meisner, we talk about Jim Cathcart, Michael Gerber, these are all champions for me. And they do not care that I have a great networking system. They do not care that I have a great sales system. They care that I'm on a mission to help introverts and they believe that that mission is important. So mm. when you make a decision that I'm passionate about this and I'm on a mission to do this, going to networking rooms and looking for those momentum partners and those champions are going to be the most powerful things for you. So knowing your passion, knowing your mission, knowing your stories, going into networking rooms and identifying who they are, going into walking down the hall and knowing who those people are, all of a sudden everything transforms because you go from that person that's uncomfortably self-promoting to that person that's trying to change something significant and everybody can get behind that. Because let's face it, when we go to work at corporations, when we go to networking rooms, how often do we actually meet somebody that's truly passionate about anything? And that's why this is so important. Boy, amen to that. And, you know, I it one, just to back you up on this, one of the most powerful things that I think I ever share with people is the concept of being responsible, not just for what you say. It's not it's not just a presentation right here. I present it to you, do with it what you will. There you go. It's not just a presentation. It's a performance. And I don't mean you're being inauthentic. I don't mean it's fake. What I mean is you're willing to be generous enough to take responsibility, not just for what you say, but also for what they hear. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to be truly impactful on someone, you can't have had the idea 30 seconds ago. Right. Good point. Very good point. Well, yeah, you know, and that's the other thing, right, is um, it really struck me, Matthew, uh, a, a little while ago that, you know, I almost died of an autoimmune disease after I lost my company, we raised $80 million plus in the dot-com days and then went out of business. And just out of the shame and embarrassment and sadness and anger, I almost died of an autoimmune disease. And I promised the universe in that hospital, thinking that I might not make it, that if it let me live, you know, if the big is let me live, I would, I promised that the only thing I would really care about was making a difference. That was, that would be a nine, number one priority, one through 10, you know, everything else would start at 11 or beyond. And I realized that my only access to that is through the generosity of someone else's listening. The only way I can make a difference for anybody is if they're willing to listen to me generously enough to let me land over there. And that made it super obvious to me that the burden was on me to prepare and to make that time and investment they gave me of listening to me generously worth it. Absolutely. And I will I will say a lot of people might be listening going, well, hang on a sec, Matt talks about passion and mission. How can you really have a passion and mission for what I do? 
And I mean, let's joke about it for a second. I mean, if you mm. were to think about one thing that most people would struggle, like let's think about, you know, the movie Groundhog Day. And I'm sure everyone mm. remembers that insurance salesperson, you know, Red, Ned Ryerson, I think his name was. And he was like trying to sell insurance. And everyone's like, well, you know, I, no one, everyone knows that that's the person you want to avoid in the networking room, right? The person that sells mm. insurance. Well, there are people that truly care about selling insurance. And usually they still come across as Ned Ryerson, right? Because they can't communicate their passion and mission. You know, yeah. I had an insurance salesperson a while back that I worked with. And, you know, this is actually a feature of my new book. But, you know, we, he taught, I, he, I said, you know, help me understand, you know, why you got new insurance. He just, I just really want to help people. And I said, well, sure you do. Like all people? And he said, yeah, I mean, everybody. And I said, okay, well, what about somebody that earns 50000 compared to somebody that earns two fifty? He said, well, obviously the two fifty. Why? Because they can buy more insurance. Well, now we're back to buying the car, right? We're not really helping people. I said, well, what about the person that makes um, two fifty a year but got there after studying at Harvard, you know, maybe grew up poor, got into Harvard by scholarship. Now he's got the C-level executive job. He's got all these people employing him and he's now making, you know, 250 versus the person that started a business and, you know, maybe saved up every dollar to start a business and helped all these employees follow their, you know, the career choices. And now he has his own business. I said, which one of those do you care more about helping? And he said, well, obviously the small business owner. I said, why? I mean, the guy that studied at Harvard, I mean, and got a scholarship did it a lot. He said, well, I just feel they deserve it more. I'm like, explain that to me. And he said, well, my grandfather, you know, he saved up every day to start a business. He then opened up a farm. He employed all these people. He looked after them so much. And then he got sick and he had to sell the farm because he couldn't be there every day to handle the, the costs and the, the fact that, you know, he couldn't run the business. He said, I just watched my grandfather literally spend the last 10 years of his life fading away on the couch watching TV in this tiny apartment. And he said, I just, I never want, I don't, I believe that no one deserves that. And so well, yeah. how would you, how would you like to spend the rest of your life helping the hustlers of the world, these people that create something out of nothing, you know, make sure they don't end up in second class retirements like your grandfather. He's like, oh, yeah. that would be amazing. I said, then just talk about that. Funny enough, everything shifted and his business took off. Yeah. Matthew, that's, it's so great. That's, you know, that's what I call people's origin stories. And I am very convinced, and it sounds like you are too, out of decades of experience now, that every single human being listening to us right now, every single human being on earth has this golden thread that just goes all the way back through their life to when they were little. And they have chosen, they've made every choice they made every time they chose this, the thing that led to where they are right now versus that, the thing that would have led somewhere else, but they didn't choose it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how it's just, I mean, the, the orchestration of the universe is just absolutely, utterly perfect. And I think what it takes is tapping into that, right? Like you just did with that guy. Exactly. And, and that's where those stories come from that are so important. And that's the kind of story that you were talking about earlier. That's so important. It's not this story of, it's not stories that start with once upon a time. It's not stories that just dump data and tell you like a book report. It's those stories that allow us to see into each other's motivations and that allow us to understand each other and, and connect with each other. And when you tell that story as a business owner, whether you're introverted or extroverted or somewhere in between, when you really dial in on that story and start sharing that, you attract the right customers and the, the, the wrong customers aren't very interested and that's okay. Right. Well, but you, you really put it out there and let people connect with you. And, and I just think that because of the way society is, I know I keep saying this, but I think because of the way society is and our, and people's experiences growing up and being laughed at when we were little and all that, I think it's very generous to be willing to go find those stories and tell those stories and share those stories because it just makes a whole new level of connection in life and business possible. You're absolutely and, and right. I'm, I'm really glad that you're out there doing this, you know, <laughs> and I'm, and I really, really, really appreciate you coming and sharing this with us. I think, you know, it's just all, 
mana from heaven and I'm a big amen to everything you've said. Well, I appreciate that. I think one of the things that is super important for, for people to understand is your origin story is, is everything. And, you know, with, with this insurance agent, all of a sudden, as soon as we got this out, he started talking about these products that he found inside the insurance space that actually helped people like his grandfather. And he had no interest in the rest of the stuff. It became obvious to him. Yeah. Now, yeah. The, tr- the truth is that the first, his story, the way I told it was an origin story, but the story, the way I shared it was when Nick was the hero in this journey, right? So it's a customer story. And the way I like to communicate, yes, you need an origin story. Yes, it needs to be based on your passion and mission. But then you also need customer stories because remember, it's not about you. But here's the interesting thing, going back to to what you were talking about, about yes, we all made these choices. A lot of people will say, yeah, but I'm not really that passionate about, you know, I don't know how to communicate or how I'm passionate about insurance. I'm like, well, you got into this for a reason. Explain why. As soon as you start delving, what specifically drew you to this? What specifically do you care about? It always comes up. And if it's not, truthfully, there is nothing worse than a rapid I, – I, look, I've learned you can create a rapid growth business out of anything, but there is nothing worse than a rapid growth business with customers you don't like and a business you can't stand <laughs> or a career sad. that you don't like with a yeah. business that you do not – you can't emotionally get behind. So change yeah. it. Today we live in this world where everybody that wants a job is getting jobs, especially the ones that are passionate. So be passionate. So, I mean, yeah. Jim Carrey once said you know, in his speech, um, I remember you know, he said, my father could have been a really funny comedian. But he decided to make the safe choice. It's a practical choice. And instead, he became an accountant. He said, (laughs) many years later, my dad got laid off and my family had to do what we could to survive. And, you know, there's a story about, you know, Jim Carrey being a janitor at school to help his family. He said, I learned a great deal from my father, but there was nothing more important that you can fail at what you don't want. So why not take a chance at what you love? And what I find is most introverts are so, I mean, the truth is, Everybody, really, especially the people in highly complex careers, can do so many amazing things. And because of that, they can't communicate any of it well. So we Mm. have to think, yes, I can do a lot, but this is what I'm truly passionate about. This is the one thing I care about most, and this is the mission that I want to be on. And that's all I'm going to communicate. So when somebody asks me what I do, I don't have to say, oh, it's complicated, or oh, I do a bunch of things. But this is what I'm put on this earth to do, and this is what I'm going to shift. And then all of a sudden, the mountains move for you, and people get behind you because they're like, finally, somebody that knows, let's help them. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, I'm I'm a little embarrassed. I meant to say this uh, at the beginning, but if you want to find Matthew, you can find him at theintrovertsedge.com. And if you want to connect with him, go to linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Matthew Pollard speaker. And it's M-A-T-T-H-E-W-P-O-L-L-A-R-D speaker. Um, so Matthew, anything else that I that I should have asked you or that you'd like to say or just put out there based on what we've talked about? No, John, I think you did great. I think the the one thing that I would always highlight for, for introverts, I mean, it's great to listen to stuff like this, stuff like this and go, yeah, I'm going to make a shift. But shifts only happen when you actually take action on the advice. And I, I think for a lot of people, they, they, they go from one idea to the next, to the next, to the next. It's what I call busy procrastination, right? It's really easy to avoid it, yes. especially if you're bright. Because then you can think of so many great things you need to know first, things you need to learn first. The thing that I would suggest is pick pick your battlefield, whether it be networking, whether it be sales, whether it be active, you know, great leadership, whether it be speaking from stage, whether it be doing a TED talk, whatever it is, decide that as an introvert, A, you can be the best at that, and then B, that you're going to learn a system to do that. And then go about doing that. And again, I don't care. I mean, of course, I'd love you to read one of my books, but I don't care if you do as long as you make that decision and find a system ideally written by an introvert. Just Google their name with the word introvert. Trust me, it'll come up. And, you know, I I found Ivan Meisner was an introvert by just typing his name and the word introvert. And the first thing that came up, oh, my God, I'm an introvert by Dr. Ivan Meisner, right? (laughs) People are talking about it these days. You will Mm -hmm. find out that the people are introverted and then learn that skill. You'll change your life. But little by little, a little becomes a lot. And the first little is realizing that as an introvert, you are not a second class citizen. As a matter of fact, I will say that I believe introverts make the best salespeople, the best networkers, the best speakers because they plan so much because they'll hold on to the process because without it, we're terrible at it for dear life to succeed at these skill sets. We always write, you know, we always get to the top of the echelon, which is why I believe introverts sit at the very top and at the very bottom, unfortunately, because those are the people that don't yet realize that they can. Well, here, here. 
Here, here. Um, so I, I uh, thank you very, very much for joining me and congratulations. You know, when we met, your first book was just launching. Now it's 55,000 copies, 15 languages, and you're, you know, a bestseller on Audible uh, with your second book. So keep up the good work. I think it's awesome. Um, and uh, and I will just say to everyone listening, um, if you are interested in finding those stories uh, so that you can apply them in Matt, say Matthew's system, I'm doing the Speak Like a Leader experience. And we've got that running maybe once a quarter and you can find it at ed dot executive speaking success dot com ed for education executive speaking success dot com and uh that is an eight person cohort based course that goes over 10 weeks and we delve into most assuredly and directly your origin story and then help you uh, apply that and bring that to a ted like talk so if that's something that you're interested in we'd love to have you join us you can find it at ed.executivespeakingsuccess.com and if you want to get that first chapter free and get matt's system go to the introvertsedge.com i think you'll be really happy you did introverted or extroverted it always helps to have a system and uh matthew uh you know i'm I'm here, I'm standing by, I'm on the sidelines cheering for you. And if I can ever be of service, you just let me know because I do love what you're doing. I appreciate that, mate. Thank you so much for having me on, John. It was great to be here. You're welcome and likewise. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on speaklikealeader.show. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome. Awesome.